Good morning, my name is Joe Willis and this is my amazing wife, Kerry Willis. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and I hope you enjoy this morning's service. Ain't no rock, ain't no rock. Gonna stand in my place as long as I'm alive, I glorify his holy name. Ain't no rock, ain't no rock. Gonna stand in my place as long as I'm alive, I glorify his holy name. Oh, praise his holy name as long as I'm alive, I glorify his holy name. Oh, praise his holy name as long as I'm alive, I glorify his holy name. Ain't no bird gonna sing in my place. This is my life, I glorify his holy name. Ain't no bird, ain't no bird gonna sing in my place. As long as I'm alive, I glorify his holy name. Oh, praise his holy name. As long as I'm alive, I glorify his holy name. Oh, praise his holy name. As long as I'm alive, I glorify his holy name. Ain't no tree gonna zip its branches. I lift my hands to glorify His holy name. Ain't no tree, ain't no tree gonna lift its branches. I lift my hands to glorify His holy name. Oh, praise His holy name. As long as I'm alive, I glorify His holy name. Oh, praise His holy name. As long as I'm alive, I glorify His holy name. Sing all three. Ain't no rock, no bird, no tree gonna stand in my place. As long as I'm alive, I glorify His holy name. Sing all three. Ain't no rock, no bird, no tree gonna stand in my place. As long as I'm alive, I glorify His holy name. Oh, praise His holy name. As long as I'm alive, I glorify His holy name. Oh, praise His holy name. As long as I'm alive, I glorify His holy name. As long as I'm alive, I glorify His holy name. As long as I'm alive, I glorify His holy name. Glory, glory. Glory, glory. Hallelujah. Since I lay my burdens down, way on down. Glory, glory. Hallelujah. Since I lay, since I lay my burdens down, way on down. I don't talk the talk that I used to. Since I lay my burdens down, way on down. I don't talk the talk that I used to. Since I lay, since I lay my burdens down, way on down. Friends don't treat me oh, no. like that they used to. Since I lay my burdens down, way on down. Friends don't treat me like they used to. Since I lay, since I laid my burdens down, way on down. I'm so happy, oh so happy. Since I lay my burdens down, way on down, I'm so happy, oh so happy. Since I lay, since I lay my burdens down, way on down, going home to be with Jesus. Since I lay my burdens down, way on down. Going home soon, be with Jesus. Since I lay, since I lay my burdens down, way on down. Since I lay my burdens down. My Lord, He done done. My Lord. He gonna give us love. He done done. He gonna give us love. He done done. He gonna give us love. He done done. He done done. What he said it to. I said, my Lord. My Lord. My Lord. He done done. My Lord. My Lord. He 
done done what he said he'd do He said he'd give us joy He done done, he said he'd give us joy He done done, he gonna give us joy He done done, he done done what he said he'd do I said my lord My lord, he done done 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 He done done what he said he'd do He gonna give us peace he done done, he gonna give us peace. He done done, he gonna give us peace. He done done, he done done what he said he'd do. I said, my lord, my lord, he done done, my lord, my lord, he done done, my lord, my lord, he done done, he done done what he said he'd do. My 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 lord, my lord, he done done, my lord, my lord, he done done, my lord. He done done what he said he'd do. He done done what he said he'd do. Good morning, church. Please turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 1, verse 35. The Bible reads, Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went up to a solitary place where he prayed. The first thing that birds do in the morning is they wake up and they're ready to claim their territory. They sing songs up in the trees with to find their mates and they're ready to search for food. Jesus had that same mindset very early in the morning. He got up to a warfare and he knew the first thing he had to do was spend time with God in prayer. My card for you guys and my challenge for you this week is to wake up very early in the morning this week and spend that quality and quantity time with God. This lesson for you today by Joe Willis will show the things that hinder our prayers, to find out what hinders our prayers and then to work on what can make our prayer life greater with God. So with that, hope you're inspired and ready for the service and let's say a word of prayer to start off. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for giving us life for giving us this morning to worship and praise you. I pray we can learn a lot from the lesson from Joe Willis and find out what can hinder our prayers and to do something about that and have great quality and quality time with you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Good morning, guys. This is another good news moment for the church. Yes. My name is Peter Wade. This is Paulina, Hello. my wife. And we're going to share some good news with you, obviously, starting in Sydney. Yeah. So, God is doing incredible things in the midst of crazy times. Though it was a four-month journey, Frida was baptized this past Monday night. Frida is a foundation student at the prestigious University of New South Wales campus here in Sydney. Next, I bring you good news from the Mexico ICC. Carlos Mejia writes, we had a powerful service this past Sunday in Mexico City. An incredible woman named Doris Velasco was baptized. Doris is a married woman and a mother of three. Also, excitingly, Jaid Soto, the church's polytechnic campus leader, baptized his sister Myra and his brother Alberto. Right before they got baptized, Jose Otero married them as the couple wanted to be right before the Lord before going into the waters of baptism. Now, what's incredible is that Jaid baptized his mom just two months prior in the month of February. Mm. So now there are four people in his family united in Christ there in Mexico City. Oh, cool. Next, I bring you good news from Atlanta ICC. Ron Harding writes, there has been a great opportunity from the United States government providing stimulus checks during the COVID pandemic. Every disciple in Atlanta who received a stimulus check generously gave their checks to their special contribution this past week, taking them to 65% of their missions fundraising goal. There was also the baptism of Catherine James, who is the cousin of Destiny, our dear sister in the AMS region of Los Angeles. Destiny participated in the baptism over FaceTime, where she got to share for her cousin and watch her go under the waters of baptism. This was the church's fourth baptism and fifth addition in the last eight weeks. Congratulations, guys. 
Next, I bring you good news from the Chicago ICC. John Causey writes, the Chicago church has now broken through to 200 members. God blessed the church with four additions, three baptisms and one amazing restoration. On Sunday, the fired up sacrificial disciples gave over $63,000 in special missions contribution. Also, Johnny Dawson, who is 75 years old, was restored to God. His wife, Mary, his son, Theo Sr., his grandson, Theo Jr., and his granddaughter, Tia, all serve in key leadership roles in the Chicago church. Wow. Now, I bring you good news from the Miami ICC, where they have had five baptisms this past week alone. That's incredible news. And they note that prayerfully, several more will make that decision this coming week. Oh, that's great. Also, staying in the United States, we bring you good news from New York City. In New York, they had two amazing baptisms this past week, Denise and Tiffany. The baptism of Denise, she's a professional model who was impacted by the recent conversion of Esmeraldis, also a professional model. Both women are actually Dominican. Wow, what the? <laughs> in London... God added two more brothers to their family. As they saw Liam, a campus student, baptized Monday night. Sergey was also baptized Wednesday night. Sergey was baptized in a singles ministry during their virtual men's midweek. I also want to bring you good news from Birmingham, UK. The Birmingham church saw two baptisms this past week, one of which was Wellington, who initially was met back in 2018 by our brother, Sean Hurdit. After initially studying the Bible, Wellington decided to run and not continue doing his studies. The disciples were so happy to see him return to continue studying the Bible and then get baptized. Wow, they're really growing there. I bring you good news from Paris, France. In Paris, God also blessed the church with the baptism of Myra, who first came out to their Women's Day back in March. She is fired up single mother who, despite COVID pandemic, was fearless about getting baptized urgently. What's crazy is Myra is also a cancer survivor. Most people with vulnerable health would understandably stay home during this time. However, Myra decided to leave isolation for salvation. Amen. <laughs> Lastly, I want to bring you guys good news from the Guam International Christian Church. The church there had an incredible baptism this past week. An awesome woman by the name of Bria went into the waters of baptism. Bria had actually received a bit of opposition from her family, but courageously still made the decision to get baptized and become your sister in Christ. Amen. Look, guys, that's all the good news we have for right now. Please make sure to go onto the website and sign up for the good news email, the sydneyicc.org. And you can see all the good news from all around the world. But enjoy the rest of the service. Hi. Sanctuary. Oh, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. With thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Savior, heart and soul, Lord, to every man. It is you, Lord, who knows my weakness. You refine me with thine own hand. Oh, Lord, prepare, oh, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. To be a And true, tried and true, with thanksgiving, and with thanksgiving I'll, be a I'll be a living sanctuary, sanctuary for, for you. you. Lead me, O oh Lord, through temptation, you refine me 
from within, fill our hearts with your Holy Spirit, and take all our sins away. O oh Lord, prepare oh Lord, me prepare to be a sanctuary. Church, my name is Emmanuel, and at this time of the service is when we take up communion. Now, communion is a time when we pass around bread, which represents the body of Christ, and we also pass around the juice, which represents the blood of Christ. And as usual, we'll have one of our awesome sisters come around to share what the cross means to them. And today, we have Jessie Brower who will be sharing. She has asked me to share a scripture, and she has asked me to read from John chapter 3, verse 30 to 31. And he reads, he must become greater, I must become less. The one who comes from above is above all. The one who is from the earth belongs to the earth and speak is one from the earth. The one who comes from heaven is above all. And with that, I give you Jesse Brown. Yes, hi guys, thank you. And um, yes, as Emmanuel shared, my name is Jesse. And um, yeah, just thank you for giving me the opportunity to share today what the cross means to me. And in this current season of my life, what the cross means to me is strength. And wow, what a crazy time it is in the world right now. It's wild, <laughs> but I'm actually super grateful that I get to live through this time and especially live through it as a disciple. I know and trust that despite all the bad things, God is doing a good work in the world and in people's hearts through this. And I definitely have seen God using this situation to show me things in my heart over the past few weeks as well. Doing a ministry job, my life is centered around outreach. We're always on campus sharing our faith, meeting people for Bible studies, meeting people everywhere we go. My life is always on the go, up early, to bed late, marathon training, there's always more to do. And don't get me wrong, I really love what I do. Um, it's awesome. However, in this corona time, we've all been forced to slow down. And as life started to slow down, I noticed I began to feel anxious. Campuses are closed. People are advised not to go out of their homes. How do I do the ministry with all of these regulations? Even attempting to share my faith in the park or at the grocery store, the few places we can go, people get scared because of social distancing when I try to talk to them. I've also struggled with guilt, feeling like I am being unproductive or not doing enough. Give me a clear structure and I'm good with that. This ambi ambiguity and unknown space makes me feel so uncomfortable because I don't have the answers. So in all of this, I decided to pray and really press in and try to understand what God is doing and trying to teach the world and myself in this time. And as I was praying, Psalm 46 came to mind. And in verse 8, it reads, Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. As I was reading this, I was sitting on a cliff overlooking a completely empty Bondi Beach, one of the most famous beaches of, in the world, and not a single soul on the sand. I don't know if that has ever happened in however many years. <laughs> and at this moment, I felt like a fog had been lifted from my eyes. As I was staring out at this desolate land, I realized that God was calling me to be still, to slow down and focus on him. And that felt so foreign to me. I spent so much of my life running around, doing so many things, always busy. And I realized that even in the ministry, a job that is centered around helping people to know God, I can so easily miss God. I can easily let all these good things get in the way of my personal time with God 
you know, marathon training, helping the girls in my ministry, etc., that I can end up doing a lot of things in my own strength. And this is not how God intended our lives to be. And so this scripture that Emmanuel um, read in John really helped me to see how small I am and how big God is. You know, we are just earthly things and God is heaven. You know, we're so small and how much we just really need God's strength in everything that we do. And so this past week, as I've been trying to implement this, it's been really amazing. I have started having longer quiet times with God and getting great insights from the Bible. We have so many women who are interested in studying the Bible over FaceTime. I've been re reconnecting with old friends. Um, and as well, I've been reading the Bible with my parents. And this is another thing that God really opened my eyes to, just having this time where things are slower and my schedule is slower. I really saw how I, I wasn't prioritizing my family. You know, I do all these ministry things, helping all these people to know God, inviting strangers to church, but I had been neglecting the most important ministry in my life, which is my parents and my family. Um, but through this time, I've been able to read the Bible with my parents every day and go through John every day, which has been really incredible. So I love you, mom and dad, if you're watching. <laughs> um, but yeah, in this time of slowing down, um, and just being still, I've realized that the ministry and life in general is really not about what I do, how hard I work, or how many hours I share on campus. If I'm not doing that with God, then it really doesn't make any difference, and I've missed the point. And so, because of what Jesus did for me on the cross, I can have this life. In the cross is where I find all my strength and everything I could ever need. And every time when I take communion, when I take the bread and the juice, I take that time to remember my true position before Christ. Always in that time, what pops into my mind is this image of me kneeling before the cross. And in that time, I just take that time to remember that position I'm in before God, my true position before Him, um, and really just pray that I could remember that position in everything that I do and rely on His strength in everything that I do in life. And so I want to encourage you all now more than ever to take this time to find God in the stillness and allow him to strengthen you. Thank you for letting me share. Awesome. Now guys, before we take the communion, let us go to God in prayer. Dear God Almighty God, thank you God that you are great. Thank you God that we can come to see how powerful you are and how little we are, but yet to not be in fear of how powerful you are, but to come to embrace it and to grow through it, God. Please be with us, Father God, as we take this communion. And I pray all these things through your son. Amen. Amen.
Good morning from the hot islands of Samoa. My name is Eric Valenzuela, and I'm from the Apia International Christian Church. Now, I've been privileged to speak on behalf of Sydney for the contribution. And instead of addressing why you guys need to give contribution, I just really want to spend this time and, and just say thank you guys. Thank you so much for your giving. Thank you guys so much for just the weekly giving you guys give, the hard, hard work that all of you do just, just from your jobs. Uh, thank you guys especially so much for all the hard work that you put in to really raising the special contribution itself. Um, I know you guys are selling cupcakes or some people sell water. I'm not sure what you guys are doing at the moment. Um, or even some running a marathon. We really, really appreciate every single bit that you guys really contribute to us. The scripture that I'm going to be looking at today is in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15. It says, All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. It's an incredible scripture that Paul is addressing to the church in Corinth. And he says, you know, it's actually for your benefit that the giving, everything that you put in, the work that you guys put in, it's actually for your benefit. Why? Because it actually, this grace, it reaches more people. And because you love God, it gives glory to God. And it's reaching not just, not just a couple, but it says more and more. It's continually growing. And in talking about contribution, we always talk about, like, what, what will your contribution do? I actually want to talk about what did your contribution already do? What has already been done? Now, there's a specific man I want to share about, um, a brother that I, I really help out in this church here. And upon making him into a disciple, his, his, his mom and dad were not supportive at all. Um, really, really telling him, hey, you can't go to church. You need to focus on your school. And so it, it came to the point where even, you know, Scotty had to get in there and talk to his dad and work out some stuff with him, right? And one time I got with him. And feeling, he was very, feeling a lot of distress, you know, he even broke down crying and he said, you know, I, I, I just can't take it anymore, bro, it's, it's, it's too much. I, I keep doing everything for the family. When, when I get told to cook, you know, I, I go and cook, but then when I'm cooking, I get told to go and do my studies. And I don't know what to do, it, it's too much for me. And he said, you know, if, if you didn't meet me 100%, I would have committed suicide by now. And it really hit me in my heart, you know, I was like, wow, like, that's, that's very, very sad. And so I was really encouraging him, brother, you, you need to persevere, bro, just keep going. I, I know it's not easy. You need to continue to go. And I gave him some instruction, right, on how to deal with his dad in this situation. And about three days later, he comes up to me, and he's super joyful, right? He's like, bro, I did it. It, it worked. It worked. I was like, what, what, are you, what are you talking about, bro? What, 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 are you, what happened? And he ends up saying, well, you remember, remember what you told me to do with my dad? Like, it worked. Like, my dad was, you know, he was, he was talking about, hey, go and, go and clean. Go and do your schoolwork. Do this stuff, right? <clears throat> and, and I didn't know what to do. And so all I said... In a calm, calm state, I just said to him, Dad, what, what do you want me to do to be a better son for you? Right? And his dad, actually, in a restored, uh, in a restored manner, was like, Son, I, I, just, you know, I, I just really want you to, to help around the house. I want you to do these things. I want you to study hard. And he responded and said, All right, Dad, I'll do that for you. And actually, later that day, he had a conversation with his dad, which does not normally happen. And he was saying how, you know, you know, I, I, I'm really hard on you, but the, the reason why I'm actually hard on you is, is and, and I tell you to do all these things, is because you're actually the only obedient son that I have. I know that you have two older brothers, but um, they, don't, they don't do anything, and I, I've kind of given up on them, and to be honest, I just really wish they were like you. You know, I, I, really, I really need help in helping them. And, he, you know, he came to me, and he was extremely joyful that it actually worked. You know, putting God's word, having faith and perseverance actually worked. And so, you know, this brother is extremely, extremely grateful for just the, the grace of God and, and the church even established here in Apia Samoa. And I, I just really want to really drive this point that, you know, what you guys are doing, all the giving that you guys are giving, really actually makes an impact. This, this is not random myths or, or things that we're talking about, made-up stories. These are real people with changed lives. And so my encouragement to you guys is really to continue to give, you know, to continue to have that heart that, you know, when you give it, it's not just paying for someone's Starbucks coffee or, you know, not just paying for some venue, but it's, it's actually creating beautiful moments that really change people's lives as the one I just shared with you. If you guys can all, please uh, bow your heads with me in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for every job that you've given us. Thank you for just even the ability to work, Father. Thank you for our hands, our feet, our hearts, our minds, God, that we can Always give back to you, Father, with, with thanksgiving, Father. Um, I thank you so much just for the Sydney Church itself, God, for the, 
the incredible generous hearts that they have to give every single week and work hard to give an overflow for all the other churches around God. Thank you so much, God. I pray that you really do bless those who give today. And please be with all of us as we try to give this grace to more and more people in this dark and lost world, God. Thank you so much for your grace that you've given to us. It's in Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. My God is real. There are some things I cannot know. There are some places that I cannot go. Cannot go. But there's one thing. There's one thing I know. That my God is real. For I can feel Him in my soul. Don't you know that? Yes. God is real. He's so real in my soul. Oh, my God is real, for He has washed and made me whole. Yes, His love for me is like you go. Oh, my God is real, for I can feel Him in my soul. I cannot tell. I cannot tell. Just how I felt when Jesus washed all my sins away, sins away. But on that day, yes, on that hour, that my God is real, for I can feel His holy power. Don't you know that? Yes, God is real. He's so real in my soul. My God is real, for He has washed and made me whole. Yes, His love for me, yes, His love for me is like pure like gold. For my God is real, for I can feel Him in my soul. Don't you know that? Yes, God is real. He's so real in my soul. For my God is real. For he has washed and made me whole. Yes, his love for me. Yes, his love for me is like you go. Is like you go. For my God is real. For I can feel him in my soul. Great. Please turn your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 46. Um, I've been really encouraged by doing all these lessons on prayer uh, and we're actually launching this Sunday a month of prayer and fasting internationally between our churches. So that's going to be a prayer chain where we'll have somebody praying prayerfully in in pairs or households for every single hour over the next 30 days to come out of the coronavirus for there to be a vaccine found for forceful advancement around the kingdom and also for every single person to have three particular needs that we'll all pray for. And that's going to be very exciting, very unifying, getting the households from different churches around the world to pray together, old friends, make new friends. And uh, there'll be a OneNotes app that uh, will be uh, coming out today. And that'll be very, very exciting. But before we get in that, of course, a relevant topic um, will really be about having the right heart in prayer. So we've talked about thanks, we've talked about supplication, we've talked about having structure in prayer. But now we're going to talk about Actually, we've got to have the right heart when we go to pray. And 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 46, it says, When they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin, and you become angry with them and give them over to their enemies, who take them captive to their own lands, far away or near. And if they have a change of heart in the land where they are held captive, And repent and plead with you in the land of their capitals and say, we have sinned, we have done wrong, we have acted wickedly. And if they turn back to you with all their heart and soul in the land of their enemies who took them captive and pray to you toward the land you gave their ancestors, toward the city you have chosen and the temple I built for your name, then from heaven, your dwelling place, hear their prayer and plead and uphold their cause. Here is talking about the heart in prayer. You've got to have the right heart. You can't be in sin and pray and expect things to happen. You know, a couple of quotes. It's not what you say, it's how you say it. 
So often when we counsel marriages, they go, well, it wasn't what he said, it was how he said it that upset me. Another quote, God can tell when you're faking it. So I've got three points. The first one is reverent submission. What type of heart should we need to have? Reverent submission. In Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7, it says, During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petition with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Some though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. You know, many people all around the world pray. That doesn't mean God listens to them or answers them. How you pray, with what heart you pray, makes all the difference to God and to whether he will hear and answer your prayer. You know, you would think automatically that Jesus would be heard by God because he was his son. Yet this verse clearly says that Jesus was heard because of his reverent submission. Jesus' reverent submission took two forms. That of his continual dependence upon God and the surrender of his will to God. So reverent submission is like when Jesus prayed in God Gethsemane in Mark 14, 36. Not your will, not my will, but yours, Lord. And then reverent submission basically equals answered prayers. You know, don't let your doubt, your fear, your stubbornness become the ceiling of your prayer. Simply put, Jesus modeled the life of someone who had their prayers answered. You know, Jesus lived to be used by God, not to use God. To live a life that pleased God, not please himself. John 5 verse 30 says, By myself I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just. For I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. You know, Jesus lived to please God, not himself. And that's why God was with him. John 8, 29 says, The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. Jesus was always super up front with anybody that followed him. He was up front in saying that their prayers would be answered only if they lived a life all about going out there and seeking and saving the lost. First on a personal scale, in John 15, 16, he said, you didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. If you're about seeking and saving the lost, when it comes to your needs and your desires, I'll take care of that. Then he also said it on a global scale. That as a church, if a church is not a movement focused on evangelizing the world, God will not be with you. Matthew 28, 19. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. It's the same thing he said to the apostles, man, you've got to go out there and build a worldwide movement, and I'm going to be with you when you do it. But you know what? If you're not part of that dream, then I'm not going to be with you, because that's what it's all about. You can't become more saved once you're saved. The only thing you can do is focus on seeking and saving the lost. You know, think about it. Is Jesus really Lord of your life? Much is made of making Jesus Lord of your life. But is he really? You know, many people quote Romans 10 verse 9. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So what does it actually mean to say that Jesus is Lord? For Jesus to be Lord of your life means he's your ruler, he's your boss, he's your master of your whole life. He cannot be Lord of a part. He must be given control of your incomplete life, the whole life. You know, it's been said, you know, if Jesus is not Lord of all, then he's not Lord at all. And when the first converts understood this, 
at Pentecost. You know, they were very, very clear that when they admitted Jesus was Lord, their first response was, what are we going to do? What do I need to do for you, Lord, now? Now you are my Lord and Master. And the answer was, repent to change. In Acts 2.36, Peter's preaching goes, therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Messiah. In other words, Jesus is your Lord. How did they respond? It says, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent, be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. When we say Jesus Lord, our response should be, now what do I need to do for you, Lord? Not how little do I have to do, not do I just need to think about it. What shall I do? It's all about where your heart is at before God, before you pray. My second point is humility through confession. Turn your Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. It says, If my people are called by my, who are called by my name will humble themselves, and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. You know, confession is an essential part of being humble. Jesus taught his disciples in what we know as the Lord's Prayer, that confession is a must when it comes to being part of prayer. Luke eleven four says, Forgive us our sins as we also forgive everyone who sins against us. There was an expectation that we would go, hey God, I've sinned in this way, in this way, in this way. I need you to forgive me. Now we all sin and we all need God's continual forgiveness and purification. This is only received by our continual confession. 1 John 1, 7 says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. It's very clear here that confession is part of the process of being forgiven by God. You know, we're commanded to confess our sins to one another, not just God. There is nothing more refreshing and bonding with another person than to meet with them, confess your sins together, and then pray for each other as the scriptures teach. James 5, 16. Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. It's part of the healing process. You know, it's amazing just about sin. You always feel like before you confess a sin, it's always going to go terribly and there's going to be mass judgment. And then after you confess it, well, there may be some disciples in your mind. I am so glad that that's out the way now. You know, confession has always been part of a relationship with God. If we go to Leviticus chapter 5, verse 1. And this was written, you know, as the Israelites came out of Egypt. Leviticus 5, 1, it says... If anyone sins because they do not speak up when they hear about a public charge to testify regarding something they have seen or learned about, they will be held responsible. If anyone becomes aware that they are guilty, if they unwittingly touch anything ceremoniously unclean, whether the carcass is of an unclean animal, or wild or domestic, or of any creature, unclean creature that moves along the ground, and they are unaware that they have become unclean, but then they come to realize their guilt, or if they touch a human uncleanliness, anything that would make them unclean, even though they are unaware of it, but then they learn of it and realize their guilt, or if anyone thoughtlessly takes an oath to do anything, whether good or evil, in any matter one might carelessly swear about, even though they are unaware of it, but then learn of it and realize their guilt, when anyone becomes aware that they are guilty in any of these matters, they must confess in what way they have sinned. There was a stage here set for the whole of Israel, when he set up the guidelines, he said, you know what? Not only do you need to confess sin when you become aware of it, when people bring it up with you, but if somebody else has fallen into sin and they don't realize that they're in sin because sin is deceitful, then we need to bring it up with them and help them come to this point where they recognize sin and they openly confess. 
Now, all Israel was told here to help each other with their sin in their life. You know, sin was to be confessed publicly and to be made atonement for. Leviticus 16, 20. When Aaron had finished making atonement for the most holy place, the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall bring forward a live goat. He is to lay both hands on the head of a live goat and confess over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites and their sin and put them on the goat's head. He shall send the goat away into the desert in care of a man appointed for the task. The goat will carry on itself all the sins of the solitary place and the man shall release it in the desert. You know, I imagine this scene. Here's a priest, he's got the goat, and he says, you've got to confess everybody's sin. And you go, God, I just, you know, I really prayed for Emmanuel, and I prayed for his sin over here, and Joe's sin over here, and Solomon's sin over here. And you imagine the audience going, you did what? You, you, he, you did what? He said, yeah, yeah, I've confessed it, it's all right, we're dealing with it now like that. But I remember so often we have these scenes, they seem so somber. But then there's also this, this aspect of like, okay, there's a real humbling going on here. And that leads me on to my next point, which is like this, this concept of the power of confession. You know, going over to Luke 18, it's not just an Old Testament situation. Luke 18, verse 9. It says, To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told them this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God! I thank you I'm not like those other people. Robbers, evildoers, adulterers, Bible talk leaders, evangelists, you know, okay. Right. Or even like this tax collector. I first twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven and beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man rather than the other man went home justified before God. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Now, why does God insist on us confessing when he already knows what sin we're in? Does he need us to confess? No. It's us that needs to confess. God's looking for humility. A person to be God-focused, not man-focused. Confession helps us start the process of repentance and turning to God, Leviticus 26.39. It can also be accompanied by fasting, especially when our heart is hard. Fasting is part of humbling ourselves, 1 Samuel 7, 5. You know, most people don't want to confess their sin openly for fear of what man will think about them. They're more worried about what people will think inside the church, outside the church, than what God thinks about them. You know, we must have a God-centered life, not a man-centered life. Continually walking in the light with a full exposed life. I know um, one of my early mentors in the church, he said, you know, when I get with my mentor, he said, I always try and think of the worst sin I've created that I've uh, done that week. And that's the first thing I start my conversation. I just want to let you know, this is what I did. He said, then from there on, the conversation always goes well, because there's not much more he can ask me. You know, confession also makes us aware of other, makes you aware of other people's sins so that you can pray for them. But also you can protect it. So if one brother studies, you know, uh, struggles with over drinking and you come from an alcoholic background, you go, ah, that's not my friend for me. I need to make a friend of somebody who doesn't struggle with that. An unconfessed sin, an undealt with sin, is terrible. It destroys people from the inside out. Psalm 32, 3. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away. Though my groaning through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me, my strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover over my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. There's nothing worse than being in sin. It eats you from the inside out. And you're just then you go, you know, you know that power is lost. You don't really want to pray. Your prayers are always the same. You battle it and, and it's just, it's terrible and you need to deal with it. And then point number three, removing what hinders our prayers. Deuteronomy 29, verse 29. It says, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may follow all the words of this law. 
You know, there are things outside our control or knowledge that stop or delay our prayers being answered. There's a lot we don't really understand, isn't there? You know, think about it. First of all, our request being outside God's will. So we may pray and go, God, answer this prayer, but he's not going to do something that is going to harm us, even if we think it's not going to. You know, Matthew 6, 10, it says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. In other words, we may go, God, give me this. He goes, if I give you that, it's not going to go well, bro. So I'm not going to give it to you. And you go, why don't you answer me? Well, I did. It's a no. I think our request being outside God's timing. Consider John the Baptist's parents, Zachariah and Elizabeth, who desperately wanted a child. They were not blessed with a child until John the Baptist came. Why did they have to wait so long? Well, John the Baptist's destiny was wrapped up with Jesus' destiny. And Jesus' destiny was set at an appointed time, Galatians 4.4. 4. So, I'm sorry, but I've answered your prayer, but just not in your timing. You've got to wait to your old age, then I'll give you John the Baptist, because then he can pave the way for Jesus. So it's not that he hasn't answered, he just goes, I ain't giving it to you now, because I've got a bigger plan. You know, 2 Peter 3.9 says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. And then again, sometimes we forget Satan's opposition. We forget often that we are at war and our prayers are often answered by God sending angels to make them happen. However, Satan and his demonic angels are trying to fight the good angels. In Daniel chapter 10, verse 12, it says, Then he continued, Do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you'll set your mind to gaining understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. And I've come in response to them. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there by the king of Persia. So he's going like, Daniel, you, you prayed to me. We heard, we answered, but man, we were in a war here. We had the demonic forces and then I had to get reinforcements. Michael came and helped me and I'm here now to answer your prayers. You know, there are many more things that we are in control of that stop and hinder our prayers being answered. These are the ones we can do something about. First of all, actual sin. The sins of commission, the sins that we do. Proverbs 28, 13 says, Whoever conceals their sin does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. There is no point going into this month of incredible prayer if you haven't got the sin on the table. You know, this afternoon, sit down with your Bible discussion, sit down with your household, get out the list, get embarrassed. You know what? We should feel that. You know what? I'm, I'm embarrassed about what I've done, but I want to change it. Hold me accountable. The sins of omission. These are things you don't. James 4, 17 says, you know, if the good you know you ought to, don't do it. That's sin, including the sin of half-heartedness. Jeremiah 29, 12 says, then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. God, you know, God can hear your prayers, but he's only going to answer them if you're wholehearted. Is there anything that's holding your heart back? Maybe unforgiveness. Maybe not believing the kingdom is real. Not forgiving others. Mark eleven twenty five. 25. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your father in heaven may forgive you your sins. You know, we have been all forgiven so many sins. How ridiculous it is when one brother or sister offends us and we go, you know, I'm just not going to forgive them of that one sin. They really hurt me. Think about how much God has forgiven us. Other things like wrong motives. We must sort out our hearts as we pray, focusing on God and others, not just our selfish desires. So James 4.3 says, when you ask, you do not receive. Because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. God, give me a million dollars so I can buy a Ferrari. Uh, no, you don't need a Ferrari. Maybe not so extreme as that. But so many of our prayers are like, I want, I want, I want. God goes, tell me your needs. Let's talk about your needs. And then doubt. You know, doubt should be destroyed. By reviewing our own motives and finding scriptures to teach us to have confidence in when we're asking uh, because we know it's inside God's will. James 1 verse 6 says, But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. You know, 
If I ask a friend, go, you know, what do you want? Oh, I'm not quite sure I may want this, want this. I'm not going to go buy him anything because I don't really know what he wants. In the same way, some of us lack confidence, we doubt, because we haven't applied a scripture going, you know, well, God give me fruit. The Bible says the harvest is plentiful. I know that's what you want. I'm confident, I'm not doubting because I know that's what you want. You know, and then owning the issue. This is one of the things I really want to talk about. James 5.16. You know, it says the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. You know, I know we talked about, you know, you've got to forgive some people. I think some of us have got to forgive God. I think some of us have got a seriously bad attitude that God hasn't done what you want him to do. He doesn't need your forgiveness, but you need to forgive him because you've got it all wrong. You're like, God doesn't love me. God loves you. You've got to, some of the people have got really bad attitudes of why God hasn't answered their prayers. You know, I had a brother come up to me a few years ago, very disappointed and hurt, a little angry that God had not answered his many, many prayers. He goes, I feel like I've been devoted to the church kingdom. I give my contribution. He was only about a year old as a Christian, actually. He said, I just don't understand why my wife has not become a Christian. So I showed him this verse. I said, let me just ask you, when was the last time you did pornography? His head drooped. He said, about a week ago. And before that, he had a week before. And the before, week before that, he had a week before. So let's just read this verse again. The prayers of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So do you think the problem lies with you or with God? All of a sudden, his anger turned to shame. I'm glad to say, not only did he have a repentant heart, but a few months later, his wife also got baptised. You see, we've got to own what we need to own. You know, it's not an uncommon thing for me to feel like there's something wrong in my relationship with God, almost like a distance, a religiosity, a weirdness. The solution for me is really, really simple. I just get out the Bible and I get a sin list out. You know, Mark 7, 20 to 23, or Galatians 5, 19, 21, Ephesians 5, 3 to 8, or Revelation 2, 7 to 8. And I get them out and I look at them and I not go, am I in sin? I go, what sin am I in? Then I can nail it, confess it, repent of it. And I particularly like going to Mark 7, 21, because one of the sins I always forget, Mark 7 talks about, you know, the first sin on the list is evil thoughts. For many of us, because we use things like Galatians 5, 19 in a study, we forget evil thoughts is a sin. We go, well, I, you know, I haven't done pornography. I, I, I haven't, you know... I haven't screamed at anybody. But what about your thoughts? Evil thoughts are just as much a sin like lust or entertaining a bad attitude. Writing those down. And then you will be refreshed. So Acts 3.19 says, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. It's very simple. God says, if you're clear, confessed, repentant, you're refreshed. So let's work this back. If you're not refreshed today, if you're not like, I'm fired up for the Lord, there's sin. How do you know that? Bible tells me. If there wasn't sin, you'd be refreshed. You're not refreshed. This afternoon, we need to sit down as a household, as friends, as marriage, and go, right, let's cool. Let's get on there. Let's start talking about it. And then just as a warning for some of us older Christians, beware of new sins. As I've gone old as a Christian, now some 30 years, I sort of, in my pride, thought, you know, I know what my basic sins are. I know about pride and, you know, not being humble and being stubborn sometimes and overeating, all these guys. You know, I, I know what my sins are, you know, so I'm pretty good. And yet, what I've found is, is that sins that didn't used to bother me now have started to creep in. And... The verse when Jesus was tempted by Satan in Luke 4, 13, it says, when the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until a more opportune time. I really see Satan sitting there going, you know what? Oh, I won't get him with the young man's sin. I'll wait, a, you know, 30 odd years and I'll get him with this. And so I, there was one of these times I just, I wasn't feeling great. I was like, there's something, something wrong in my heart. I can, and, I, and I started praying and I started praying for this and that. And I thought, maybe it's about this brother. And I was Praying and I go, have I got unforgiveness? I go, no, he helped me, but any bad attitudes? No. But I don't feel like I want to pray for this brother. So there's something wrong. I, I went through everything and I went, what is it? 
And so I really started struggling. So I spent just a week fasting. I'm like, we, we've got to get rid of some of this sin. I'm not, I'm, there's something stopping me in my relationship with God. And there it was. As so I started to pray and fast, it was jealousy. Now, I've never really thought of myself as a jealous person, thinking, you know, you know, I like this person. But what it was, was I was jealous that this brother, we were discipled by the same person, was getting far more time with the, my disciple and mentor than me. I was like, man, I'm so jealous of that brother. And there it was. A new sin. 29 years into a Christian, Satan had gone, okay, more opportune time. I'm going to get you with this one. It really shocked me how sin can creep up, up on you, particularly as an older Christian. And then that's the pride I have as an older man. But you know, what we've talked about today is having the right heart in prayer. There's no point going to God with prayer with great expectations until we've first sorted out our heart. You know, reverent submission. That's why Jesus was heard. Your will, not my will. You know, humility through confession. A lot of us have been brought up in an environment where we just want to look good. You know, I want to look good in front of God, not man. And then removing what hinders our prayers. In this month of 30 days of fasting and praying internationally, you now spend this afternoon clearing out your heart, confessing, talking things through, phoning your brothers and sisters to make sure they've done it. With other marrieds, start off the month unhindered and ready to be blessed. Amen. We're crossing over. We're crossing over. One by one. We're moving on. We're moving on to the setting sun. Don't let him catch Don't you. Don't let him catch you with your work undone. We're crossing over. We're crossing over. One by one. Go make disciples. Go make disciples. One by one. We're moving on. We're moving on to the setting sun. Don't let him catch you. Don't let him catch you with your work undone. We're crossing over. We're crossing over. One by one, one. go you share your faith. Go share your faith. One by one, we're moving on. We're moving on to the setting sun. Don't let him catch Don't you. Let him catch you with your work undone. Go share your faith. Go share your faith. One by one, go read your Bible. Go read your Bible. One by one, we're moving on. We're moving on to the setting sun. Don't let him catch you. Don't let him catch you with your work undone. Go read your Bible. Go read your Bible. One by one, we'll go to heaven. Go to heaven. One by one, we're moving on. We're moving on. Don't let, Don't let him catch you with your work undone. We'll go to heaven. We'll go to heaven. One by one. We'll go to heaven. We'll go to heaven. One by one. We'll